Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so that's the big point that is up on the screen that I want you to see is that heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus says, but my words will not pass away. Jesus has told us the end from the beginning. He told us what would happen before it happens. Why? So that when it happens, we would have confidence in him, that we would trust in him. So that's what we need to, we need to confide in. That's what we're going to come back to. That's really the practical import of what we're looking into. So with that said, this is where we're heading in, you know, this is just kind of summarizing what I just said and, and pointing us in the direction of what I'd like to accomplish in the next little while. But the two chapters of Matthew chapters 24 and 25 are known as the Olivet Discourse. The reason for this is, of course, Jesus is giving this discourse while he is sitting upon the Mount of Olives. And we will see that. Uh, here in just a few moments. But these two chapters, known as the Olivet Discourse, serve as the single greatest concentration of prophetic teaching in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, They're, as such, some of the most controversial sections of the Gospels because prophecy, by nature, hasn't happened yet, right? It's something that is future to us, and so to a certain extent, it is mysterious, it is uh, a bit unknown, And so it can be an area of great controversy. And what I'm going to do is basically uh, this morning, I'm going to give you my best understanding of this passage of Scripture as we look at it, as we concentrate on it, in order to, as we said, trust in the words of Jesus. Jesus told us what would happen before it happens. Why? So that we can learn he is trustworthy. That heaven and earth will pass away, but his words, the words of Jesus, will not pass away. We can trust in him. We can confide in him. And so our goal is to examine the teachings of Jesus regarding the end times and to allow the scripture to remind us that the words of Jesus are steadfast and sure. They will not pass away. Therefore, he is worthy of our trust. And so that's the practical import of what we're looking at here today. So here's a survey of where we're heading. And if you have that handout that I sent you and and you looked at, at it over the last couple of days, then you saw the big points that we're trying to accomplish here today and next week, between this week and next week. But what we're going to look at is, number one, the setting for the Olivet Discourse. I want to take just a few minutes. We're going to look at chapter 30, or 23, excuse me, Matthew 23, and just try and understand the setting, because the better you understand the setting for the Olivet Discourse, the better you can appreciate and discern the discourse itself. So we're going to look at the setting for the Olivet Discourse. Then we're going to talk about the structure of the Olivet Discourse. That, you know, what is it? How is it structured? What's the flow of thought to this discourse? And then we're going to look at the sequence. We're going to get a little bit more detail. That's kind of point three there, which I would like to start today, but we'll we'll really deal with this more so next week in more detail, that is. But I want to look at number three there, the sequence of end times events. I want to start talking through what Jesus said would happen that we are witnessing, we're living through at least some of it. And so as we are looking at these things and we look more detailed at the sequence of end times events, we can look at the words of Jesus and have confidence in what he said and what he said would happen. We can watch that unfold. So jumping right in and trying to make some progress here this morning, let's begin with the setting for the Olivet Discourse. The setting for the Olivet Olivet Discourse. If you have a Bible, let's let's begin by reading Matthew chapter 23. We're just going to read verses 37 to 39 here briefly. And we'll actually, we'll, we'll start in chapter 23, verse 37, and read down into the first couple of verses there of chapter 24. And let's understand the setting of the discourse before we jump into the discourse itself. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered, gathered thy children together as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And when Jesus went out and departed from the temple, his disciples came unto him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, 
when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the, of the end of the world? Now, that passage gives to us the setting for the Olivet Discourse that I want to just try and recreate here briefly for just a few moments before we look at the discourse itself. First of all, recognize that Jesus has suffered rejection by the Jewish leadership, the Jewish nation. Though the Sanhedrin, that would be the governing body of the Jewish nation, made up by Pharisees and Sadducees, but the leadership of the nation of Israel rejected Jesus as Messiah. The people of the nation had basically decided to side with the leadership. They had decided to uh, follow the Sanhedrin rather than Jesus, and Jesus recognizes this. And so Jesus suffers the rejection of the Jewish nation, and he laments over the city of Jerusalem. In that, in that passage, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you would not. He recognizes that the nation has rejected him, so he laments over the nation, and he forecasts the fall of Jerusalem. He says, Your house will be left unto you desolate. So as Jesus says these words, he utters these famous words that we'll look at a little bit more closely in just a second. He then departs from the city of Jerusalem and he goes to the Mount of Olives. When he arrives at the Mount of Olives and he sits down, the disciples who are reveling in the temple as they're depart, departing from the temple and the city of Jerusalem, they're walking through the Temple Mount. They're reveling in the beauty and the grandeur of the temple and they're saying, hey, Jesus, look at this, look at that. Jesus makes an announcement that the, the temple will be destroyed. The city will be, will be destroyed and come to ruins. Well, as Jesus makes that announcement and he sits upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples then decide to gather around him and inquire about the end times. In other words, they're saying, whoa, Jesus, what did you mean by that? When will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? They want more detail regarding the announcement that Jesus just made. So what happens as Jesus sits down to, to, describe, to answer their question and describe these events, I want you to realize what's going through the mind of the disciples. What is the context of this discourse? Recall that Matthew, we didn't read the whole chapter. I'd encourage you to do that on your own later. But Matthew chapter 23 records a series of woes that Jesus pronounces upon the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus is, because they have rejected him, he pronounces woes upon them. In other words, he exposes their hypocrisy. He announces their ultimate judgment. He knows that he has been rejected. He predicts his own rejection. But he also predicts the downfall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the city and the destruction of the temple. But what I want, don't want you to miss is, in particular, verse 39 of chapter 23, when Jesus says, For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, though Jesus foretold the destruction of the city and the destruction of the temple, he also foretold of his return, that Jesus would come back. And this is what the disciples in particular are wanting a little bit more information on is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's focus on that verse, chapter 23, verse 39, for just a moment. But what I want you to see is that Jesus is saying he will return. He will come back as he's leaving the city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. And he's going to the Mount of Olives and he announces the fall of the temple and the destruction of the city. He says, this isn't the end. I will be back. I'm coming back. But before Jesus comes back, before the return of Messiah, or what you and I have come to, to label as the second coming of Christ, he says that there's a requirement, there's a prerequisite to that, namely Israel's repentance. He says, I will come, but only when you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, Jesus is looking for the nation to repent and to acknowledge him as the true Messiah before he comes back. Now, the point that to be, to be made in all of this is, as I sh show you there on the screen or in your handout, hypocrisy breeds a unique kind of spiritual blindness. The nation of Israel was full of their own hypocrisy and self-righteousness. They rejected Jesus as the true Messiah. 
And that sort of hypocrisy that they had breeds a unique kind of spiritual blindness, which oftentimes requires extreme measures to be rescued from. In other words, God has to get rough with hypocrites in order to bring them to the end of themselves and to bring them to genuine repentance. Because hypocrisy, by definition, is, uh, is people full of self-righteousness. They're competent in their own righteousness. They don't think they have any needs or problems. And so God has to get rough with hypocrites many times in order to bring them to the end of themselves and to repentance. Well, that's what God promises to do to the nation of Israel at large. God promises to bring Israel to repentance. And this, ob this subject of Israel's repentance has been the subject of many Old Testament prophets. We don't have the time to go there, and we're not going to take the time uh, this morning, but you can have it, you have it there in your notes. Leviticus 26 is one of the first places God foretells that this would happen. He talks about the curses God will bring upon the nation and how the whole point of those curses, God is orchestrating history to, to bring hardship upon the Jewish nation. Why? To bring them to humility, to bring them to humble repentance. Leviticus 26 is one of the first places that talks about that. Look at Hosea, Daniel 9, which we're going to look at that in a few moments. And then Zechariah 12. These are just some examples of places where God foretold of the repentance of the nation that he, is, he has to bring them to repentance. And so what God is going to do is he is going to design history, which will climax in a period, the last three and a half years of human history before Jesus comes back. That period is what Jesus himself labels in Matthew 24, verses, verse 21. Jesus labels that time period of history, the final three and a half years of human history, he labels that the Great Tribulation. God is designing that period of history to bring Israel to repentance. So what Matthew 24 is going to cover, what Jesus is going to talk about in Matthew chapter 24, in one chapter, is going to be elaborated and expanded upon in the book of Revelation. Now, if you want more detail on this, I encourage you. Our Revelation series is all about this. We, we, and again, if you want more detail on this, I greatly encourage you. Get on our website, start listening through or re-listening, perhaps, if you were part of that series in the past, listen through our Revelation series to understand this era of history. But what Matthew 24 is going to cover in one chapter, the book of Revelation will cover in multiple chapters. But the point of that era of history is, is these chapters, these passages, Matthew 24, Revelation 6 to 19, will describe this crucible that God is going to put the nation of Israel through to bring them to the end of themselves, to bring them to humiliation, to bring them to genuine repentance. And so this is the time period of history that we're, you know, we're studying, that we're interested in, that the disciples were asking about. So as Jesus announces the downfall of, of Jerusalem, he promises that he will one day return after Israel repents then upon this announcement, he leaves. He leaves the city. And that's what's recorded in Matthew 24, first couple of verses, when he says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And then Jesus has to, like, rehearse what he just said. He says, Didn't you hear me? I'm going to, you know, I just announced. These things will be destroyed. Well, he has to rehearse it. And he says in verse 2, Do you not see all these things? Verily I say unto you, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And so as Jesus emphasizes that point, the disciples gather around, you know, to ask a little bit more specifics. Now, we've talked about this before, and I'm not going to take the time to recreate it all, but, you know, Jesus' departure from the temple here, the act of Jesus leaving is rather fascinating because it's reenacting that famous section from the book of Ezekiel, chapters 8 to 10, when God leaves his temple, and we won't go back and recreate that, but if you recall, the nation of Israel in the days of Ezekiel had rejected God. And so as a result, God was removing his presence. He was removing his blessing. He forsook the temple, which is where he was supposed to dwell, right? He left the temple and he left the nation to be destroyed. Well, Jesus in the New Testament is basically reenacting that. Do you see? Jesus is the presence of God on earth. He is leaving the temple. He's forsaking his people. Why? 
He's removing his presence because they rejected him, just like what happened in the days of Ezekiel. It's happening again in a New Testament context. And so Jesus is forsaking. He's leaving the temple because they have rejected him. And as he's leaving, the disciples are just saying, wow, look at this temple. As they're, and and we'll talk, I'm going to show you pictures in just a second. The temple itself was a marvelous structure, impressive. And the disciples, it was a mark of Jewish pride, the temple was. The Herodian temple was a mark of Jewish pride. The, the Jewish nation at large reveled in this. And so as they're walking through it, even though Jesus just declared that, that the temple would be destroyed and the city would be destroyed, you know, the disciples are like, look at this. Look at the grandeur of this, the marvel of this. So it's, they're evidencing the fact that they just missed Jesus' point, right? So Jesus goes out of the city up to the Mount of Olives and he says, he rehearses it again. Guys, look at this temple. It will be destroyed. And so the disciples want some further clarification. But just to illustrate the fact of why the Jews were so proud of this temple, why the disciples were, were reveling so much in this temple, let me show you just a couple quick graphics. And I'm not going to take long on this. If you were with us in our, some of our previous studies, particularly our geography study, then we went long and hard on the Herodian temple. It was a marvelous uh, structure in the ancient world. But what I throw up there is a computer graphic regarding... You know, it's comparing Solomon's temple in the Old Testament with Herod's temple in the New Testament. We often talk about Solomon's temple as a beautiful structure, and it was. In its day, Solomon's temple was one of the most important structures, uh, most, most, you know, I guess displayed from an architectural and a wealth standpoint. It was one of the most impressive structures of the ancient world when it was built. Solomon's temple was. We have multiple chapters in the Bible given to describe that. But the, the Temple of Solomon was nothing compared to Herod's Temple. Herod's Temple was much larger, much more grandiose, much more impressive. And Herod started work on it about 19, uh, to 20 to 19 BC, but he, he didn't, it, you know, it actually wasn't completed. All the renovations, etc., weren't completed until the 60s AD. And so it goes on for several decades. It was a huge structure. Uh, gorgeous, and it dominated the city of Jerusalem. And this graphic is kind of fascinating in that it shows you the Temple Mount in relation to the city of Jerusalem at large. The Temple Mount was, get this, it, it was about 40 acres in size, the Temple Mount complex. Just to put perspective on that, you could fit 26, 26, 26 American football fields, full-size football fields, on the Temple Mount. It's huge. It was massive. It dominated the city of Jerusalem. And yet, this is, and this is what the disciples and Jesus were walking through as they're heading to the Mount of Olives. This drawing that I throw up on the screen is, act, I think this comes from the ESV Study Bible, a series of drawings, really helpful drawings, just, just to show you the complex that the temple uh, stood upon. The next slide is a zoom into the temple complex itself. Right, you kind of have the court of the Gentiles, you have the court of women, the court of Israel. Uh, you know, there's, there's much that we could talk about here. Uh, I'm trying to breeze through it for sake of time, but I just want you to visually look at, these are drawings, but a recreation. We're mainly leaning upon Josephus and some other first century sources to try and recreate what that temple would have looked like. Here's uh, the temple itself, kind of zoomed into the actual structure, the holy place, the holy of holies. But as magnificent as these this temple was, the complex was, Jesus foretold that the temple would be destroyed. The center of Jewish pride would be devastated. Jesus foretold this would happen. This is a, just an artist's rendition of that, a, a depiction of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, because Jesus foretold this would happen, that's exactly what happened. Is A war broke out between the Jews and the Romans in AD 66, it lasts for four years. The temple is destroyed. The city of Jerusalem falls in AD 70. And just like Jesus said, not one stone of the temple was left upon another. This picture is a picture of modern Jerusalem where the stones of the temple, what happened was, this is a fact of history. Josephus records this, that what happened was when the temple itself was destroyed, it caught fire and the precious metals, the gold that overlaid the temple melted because of the heat and it ran down through the cracks. And so the Roman soldiers, to get at the booty, 
right, to get a hold of that gold, what they did was they disassembled the temple stone by stone, and they took the temple apart in order to get at the gold. And they took those stones and they threw them over the edge of that massive complex. They, right? So the temple itself was dis- disassembled sto- stone by stone. The complex, the temple mount, it's, as it sometimes is called, upon which the temple proper stood, that still stands today. You can see it in the city of Jerusalem. I've, I've been there. But the temple itself, was, was, which is what Jesus was predicting, was disassembled stone by stone. The stones were thrown over the edge, and there's a pile of them that still are there. You can visit that in Jerusalem today. And it's rather fascinating visual evidence of the fact that Jesus' prediction came to pass. But the point that I'm, I'm trying to make is that Jesus, in the Olivet Discourse, is foretelling the destruction of that temple that he walked through, but he's also foretelling the destruction of another temple, which is future even to us. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But a quick point on the location of the Olivet Discourse, which I think is kind of fascinating. We call it the Olivet Discourse because it is given from the Mount of Olives. Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. That is the mountain east of the city of Jerusalem. He's sitting on the Mount of Olives as he gives this discourse. Why is that so appropriate? Because, don't forget, Zechariah 14 in your Old Testament. We're not going to go there for sake of time. I'm you know, taking too much time with it as it is. But Zechariah 14 foretells that the second coming of Jesus, when the Messiah come, comes back, he will touch down, as we sometimes say, upon the Mount of Olives. And so how appropriate is it for Jesus to talk about his second coming while he's sitting upon the Mount of Olives? And so it's kind of fascinating. But what Jesus, as he sits down upon the Mount of Olives, four of his disciples, and we don't get that from the Matthew account, we get it from the Mark account. You can see it there on the screen. Uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 3, tells us that four disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, four disciples show up to Jesus to, to ask him two very specific questions. After he exits the temple, makes the announcement of the destruction of the city, they gather round and they say to him two things. Ask him two things. Number one, when will these things be? And then they say, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? When will these things be and what will be the sign of the coming in the end of the age? In other words, they're asking, you know, the, the when and the what. How do we know this is coming and when will it come? But what I want you to see is that Jesus answers those two questions. Don't get confused here. Listen carefully. Jesus will answer those two questions in reverse. First, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to discuss the signs leading up to the second coming. He's going to discuss the what. Secondly, Jesus is going to discuss the timing of the second coming. The when. In other words, he's going to answer their, their, their two questions, but he's going to do it in reverse. So Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, verses 4 to 35, is going to answer the second question. The signs leading up to the second coming. And then verses 36 to 42 of the chapter, Jesus is going to talk about the timing of when these things will occur. Does that make sense? Don't get confused by that. It's easy to get confused by that. But Jesus is going to answer their questions. He's just going to do it in reverse. So what I want you to see, let's zoom out now real quick. What I want you to see, what Jesus is going to cover in the Olivet Discourse is the events leading up into his second coming. And I want to give you the bird's eye view of the Olivet Discourse, the structure of the Olivet Discourse. In other words, what you are to be looking for as we look through these couple of chapters. And it can get kind of confusing, and here's why. Because the Olivet Discourse, as I I say in your notes, is recorded in all three synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, sometimes called the synoptic Gospels, comes from a Greek word that means they, they view it the same. They come from a similar perspective. The synoptic Gospels all cover the Olivet Discourse. This is both a blessing and a curse in that we have more information. We have a lot of information for comparison and contrast. However, we also have so much information, it can be confusing. And so this is why the Olivet Discourse is typically one of the most difficult portions of the whole Bible to study. But 
what I want you to see, for instance, is Luke 21, for instance, and we're not going to take the time to go there today. I have given lectures to this in the past. If you're interested in it, we talk about this during the Patterns of Prophecy study when we talk about the nation of Israel uh, and the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. That event is covered specifically in Luke 21. However, Matthew 24 is talking about something else. They're very similar, and it can be very confusing, can be very difficult to, to unravel this. And we give a lecture to the fall of Jerusalem in uh, our Patterns of Prophecy series. We also talk about the relationship between Luke 21 and Matthew 24, how they're similar. They sound very similar, and we'll talk about why in just a moment, but they're different. They're talking about two different events. We talk about their relationship in more detail in our Revelation series. We do a one-week survey of the Olivet Discourse, and that's up on our website in, you know, beneath our Revelation study. And so you can consult that if you want more information there. But here's an example of how the old Olivet Discourse can be so confusing. Luke 21 is talking about the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Matthew 24 sounds very similar, but it's dealing with a different fall of Jerusalem. It's talking about the fall of Jerusalem during the end of days, the tribulation time period. They, if you read those two chapters, they sound very similar. And why? Well, because they're both talking about the fall of Jerusalem. But Luke 21 is talking about the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, while Matthew 24 is talking about the fall of Jerusalem that is in the tribulation time period. In other words, you can read Luke 21 as history. From our perspective in history, Luke 21 has already happened. It's history. Matthew 24 has not yet happened. It's prophecy. All right? And I'm not going to take the time to go through and build that case and, and you know, articulate all those arguments here this morning, but we can address those if you've got more questions about that. But what you're going to find in the Olivet Discourse, all right? So think with me carefully through Matthew 24 now. Matthew 24 and 25 is going to unfold in four major movements. It's going to unfold, the flow of thought is going to unfold in four major movements. Number one, in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 14, Jesus is going to describe a time that he labels as the beginning of sorrows. That is the time period. I would love to get to this this morning because this is, the, this is where I'm getting most of the questions that you all are asking. Because this period that, that Jesus talks about is the time period that you and I are living in. So much of what you read about in Jesus' prediction of a time period that he labels as the beginning of sorrows, you know, as you're looking around at the pandemic, the earthquakes, the famines, the locust plagues that are taking place all over the world, you're, you know, if you're a Bible reader, an attentive Bible reader, you're probably scratching your head and you're saying, wait a minute, did Jesus foretell these events? Yeah, he did. And the, where he foretold of that is right there in a section he calls the beginning of sorrows. So we're going to talk about that here today uh, best we can. But after he talks about that, he then is going to talk in Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22, he is going to talk about the abomination of desolation. Now, we're going to define that in due time, but this reference in Matthew 24, verse 15, when Jesus says, let me just read the verse, Jesus says this, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, he says, when you read this, let him understand. And then on he's going to go you know, into the, the discourse. But the point is, Jesus is going to quote a passage from Daniel chapter 9, which anchors the timeline for us. It tells us, it sinks what Jesus is saying in Matthew 24 with a prophecy that had already existed, a prophecy that Daniel gave back in Daniel chapter 9. And it's very important for us to recognize that. We're going to spend some time in Daniel chapter 9 here this morning because, according to Jesus, we're not going to understand the sequence of events in the end times. We're not going to understand the timeline that Jesus is pointing out unless we understand 
the prophecy from Daniel. And so that reference in verse 15 that Jesus makes to Daniel's prophecy is incredibly important for us to understand. So we're going to take some time to go back and recreate that. But Jesus, in the Olivet Discourse, is first of all going to describe a time period of, of uh, time that he labels as the beginning of sorrows, which leads up to the final three and a half years of human history. How do we know it's the final three and a half years of human history? It's We're going to see an event that will be global and conspicuous, known as the abomination of desolation. We'll talk about that you know, in, in a little bit. But when that happens, we know there's only three and a half years left to human history, and Jesus will come back after that three and a half years after the abomination of desolation. So what Jesus is then going to do next in the Olivet Discourse is from verses 23 to 31 of Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is going to describe the second coming itself. He's going to describe how he's going to come in the clouds. All the world will see him. It's going to be a marvelous, spectacular event. He's going to describe that in Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 to 31. And then in verses 32 to 42 of that same chapter, Matthew 24, verses 32 to 42, Jesus is going to discuss the timing of these events, when they will happen. After which he gives a series of parables, all of which implore us to watch carefully, to keep your eyes out, to watch what God is doing. And that's really the tail end of chapter 24 and the rest of chapter 25, the Olivet Discourse. And so that's where we're heading. That's the structure of the Olivet Discourse and what we're going to look at in the next, uh, both you know, between today and next week as we look at this passage of Scripture. But let's talk more specifically about Daniel chapter 9 for just a few moments. Because like I said before, as we study the sequence of end times events, we have to anchor our timeline. Where do, how do we know it's the end of the age? You know, when will these things be? What's the sequence of events? Well, the source that anchors our timeline, that gives us the idea that there will be a seven-year tribulation period or the final three and a half years of human history that Jesus calls the Great Tribulation. Where do we get those ideas? Seven years, three and a half years. We get those ideas from Daniel chapter 9, a prophecy known as the 70 weeks prophecy. And you're not going to understand Matthew 24 until you first understand Daniel chapter 9. All right, so go there briefly. Let's spend a few moments talking about this, okay? If you got your Bible, go to Daniel chapter 9. Now, we're not going to take the time to go through the whole chapter. Again, if you want to consult this in our Revelation study up on our website, we give a whole lecture to this chapter, Daniel chapter 9 and the 70 weeks prophecy. But let me hit the high spots, remind you of it, if, you've, if you're already familiar with this passage. If you're not, then this will be an introduction to this passage. And then if you have you know, more specific questions about a part of this prophecy or whatever, text it to Daniel. We're going to get to those in a few minutes. But Daniel chapter 9, the setting to the prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, first 19 verses, is recalled Daniel is in exile in Babylon. He's a Jew who's living in Babylon because he was exiled there. But he's reading his Bible. He reads Jeremiah, the prophet, and he recognizes that the time period of the Babylonian captivity is almost over. The 70 years are almost over. So Daniel begins to pray. He asks God to forgive the nation of their sins, to restore the Jewish people back to the land. And he begins to ask for God to keep his promises. Well, God dispatches an angel, Gabriel. He dispatches Gabriel to go to Daniel to tell Daniel what's going to happen in the next 490 years of Hebrew history. That's Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 to 23, what I call the preface to the prophecy. That's Gabriel showing up and saying, hey, Daniel, I got an answer for you. You're praying about what's going to happen. I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you what's going to happen. And then Daniel receives from Gabriel the 70 weeks prophecy which is Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Let's read that. Okay, so if you've got your Bible, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27 says this. Gabriel speaking to Daniel says this. 
Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, or sixty-nine weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after the three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. One more week. In other words, that's the 70th week. Verse 27. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of the abomination shall he, shall he make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate or the desolator. Now, let me explain these verses briefly before we get back to, to Matthew 24. Because Jesus, by quoting this passage, is telling us we're not going to understand Matthew 24 unless we first understand Matthew, or excuse me, unless we first understand Daniel chapter 9. So this is what we have ahead of us. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, is going to unfold like this. Verse 24 gives us the scope of the prophecy. That is the who what, when, where of this prophecy that Gabriel is giving to, to Daniel. Verse 25 is going to talk about the coming of Messiah. I'm going to argue that that is referencing the triumphal entry itself. Verse 25. Verse 26 is the crucifixion of Jesus, the Messiah being cut off, and then the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Verse 27 is the prophecy that it, we are most interested in, and that is the 70, 70th week of Daniel. In other words, well, and we'll talk about it more in a second, but verses 24, 5, and 6 have already happened. That's history. From our perspective, looking backwards, verses 24, 5, and 6 have already happened. That's history. Verse 27 is prophecy. It hasn't happened yet. We're still waiting for that. So, what is this whole idea of the weeks, the 70 weeks prophecy? Well, understand briefly that as he says, as Gabriel says in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city. What does he mean by 70 weeks? Well, the word weeks, the word translated weeks in English is a word that simply means seven. In the Hebrew culture, it was used the same way that you and I use the word dozen. What does that mean? When I say dozen, what does that mean? It just means 12. It's a, it's a number. But it, it can be a number applying to anything, right? I can, be, I can talk about a dozen eggs or for you know, others of you, it might be more like a dozen donuts, right? Um, but either way, the idea of a dozen, it just simply means 12. It's just a number. That's the same way this word is used. Weeks just means seven. Seven of something. Seven of anything. And when you're talking about the Hebrew calendar, as you can see up on, you know, in your notes there on the screen, seven can reference many things. It can be a, a seven days. When you and I hear the word week, we tend to hear, we tend to think of seven days, such as, you know, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, talking about the Sabbath, right? The, the, the seven weeks, or excuse me, seven days in a week the seventh of which is called the Sabbath. But the Hebrew calendar also had a week of weeks. For instance, the Feast of Pentecost was to be a week of weeks, seven weeks after the Feast of First Fruits came the Feast of Pentecost in Leviticus 23, verse 15. Or Leviticus chapter 25 talks about a week of years because every seventh year was to be the year of release, but after seven sevens, after seven weeks of years, there was the year of Jubilee, right? Every 50th year. So 
the point is that term weeks, 70 weeks, the word weeks can refer to days, weeks, or years. But I'm going to argue from the context as we continue to read the prophecy of Daniel 9, it's talking about groups of years. So when Gabriel says, I'm about to tell you what's going to happen for 70 weeks, he's talking about 490 years of history that he is going, Gabriel is going to tell Daniel what will happen to the Jewish people in 490 years of, of Hebrew history. And that's the whole point of the verse. When he says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in this 490 year chunk, it's going to happen to your people, the Jews, upon the holy city, Jerusalem, and what it's going to accomplish are these six things. And we're not going to take the time to comment on all those, but it's basically the, the summation of history. God's going to punish the Jewish nation all they need to be punished. He's going to uh, take care of their sin. The sin will be taken care of. The most holy place will be anointed. Everlasting righteousness and pro the seal up the vision of prophecy. Everything that God said would happen prophetically will, will happen. It will come to its culmination and its climax within these 490 years of history. Does that make sense? That's the scope of the prophecy, verse 24. But let's look at the next verse. He says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Verse 25, Gabriel gives a snapshot of the first 69 weeks of years, or, in other words, the first 483 years. And Gabriel tells Daniel, you can start counting the 483 years from the commandment, the going forth, the issuing of an edict, the commandment that will allow Jerusalem to be rebuilt. In other words, our time clock needs to start when this commandment goes forth. What commandment are we talking about? Well, I throw it there in your notes that the commandment to go and rebuild Jerusalem is not the commandment of Ezra chapter 1 when Cyrus releases the nation of Israel to go back to the promised land. That's not what we're talking about. It might be the commandment of Ezra chapter 7, which does have to do with the city of Jerusalem. That, was, that edict was issued in 458 B.C., but what I'm going to argue, and not on my own authority, I'm, you know, of course, leaning upon people much smarter than myself, scholars that are really into this, I'm going to argue the best reference here of the commandment to go forth and restore and build Jerusalem is the commandment given in Nehemiah chapter 2, where Nehemiah, the cupbearer of the king, is given the commandment to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. When he is given that commandment, it is in 445 B.C. He is given that commandment. Gabriel says, boom, from that commandment forward, start counting 483 years or 69 weeks of years. Because after 483 years, the Messiah is coming. That's what Gabriel foretells to Daniel. So is that what happened? Well, yes, that's exactly what happened. The duration of 483 years, if you count, again, because we're kind of arguing, which one do we count from? Do we count from, excuse me, let me go backwards there. Are we counting from 458 BC, Ezra chapter 7? Or are we counting to, you know, from 445 BC, Nehemiah chapter 2? I'm going to argue it's Nehemiah chapter 2. But either way, if you even count from, from 458, where does that take you? Because remember, there's no year zero. And you can, if you do the math, it will take you to A.D. 26. 483 years will take you to A.D. 26, which is the year that Jesus is baptized. It's the year that his ministry is inaugurated. But I'm actually going to argue, like I said before, that Nehemiah chapter 2 is the better date to start with. So if we count 483 years, are you with me? Are you still hanging in here? I know it's high school math here. But if we count 483 years from 445 BC, and we have to, it can get kind of detailed. If you're really interested on this, I, I would recommend a couple of great resources. 
Harold Honer, for instance, is a guy who put out a book called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. Uh, I've had to read that a couple different times in an academic setting. Um, the, I would recommend his book probably first because it's just the most, I think, accurate. But the point is, if we count 483 years beginning at 445 B.C., guess where that takes us? It takes us to A.D. 33. Not just the year, but some scholars will go so far to arguing the month and the day. They will argue that it will take us to the day of the triumphal entry, when Jesus walks into the city of Jerusalem. Now, the reason that's significant is in Luke 19, verse 38, Jesus, in the triumphal entry, talks about the day. He says, you need to understand this day of my presentation. And it's rather a fascinating passage, and I know we've talked about that before, but Daniel chapter 9 has been heralded as one of the most dramatic examples of prophecy anywhere in the Bible because you know Gabriel gave to Daniel over four, almost five centuries in advance. He gave Daniel the, the year, for sure, if not down to the very day that the Messiah would be declared to the nation of Israel. And if you do the math, it takes you right to the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ in AD 33. It is stunning. It is so fascinating. It's fabulous. But that's what Gabriel foretold. He, he then says in the next verse, however, read verse 26. Uh, he says, and after the three score and two weeks, or again, he's, he's referencing the last mention of three score and two weeks there in verse uh, 25. He says, after the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, that next phrase of verse 26, after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. What is that talking about? The word cut off means to be executed for a capital crime. Was Jesus executed for a capital crime? Yes, he was. We call it the crucifixion. However, it tells us he will be cut off or executed not for himself. In other words, he didn't deserve to be put to death. Is that true of Jesus? Yes, it is. And it, it's, it's really, again, we could get lost in this. We could go to Isaiah 53. We could talk about the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus, etc., etc. But the point is, verse 26 of Daniel 9 is foretelling almost five centuries before it happens, right? 483 years before it happens. It's foretelling the crucifixion of Jesus. So the Messiah will be cut off. He'll be executed for a capital crime, but not for himself. It then says in the next part of the verse that the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. In other words, after the Messiah is executed the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary will be destroyed. Did that happen? Yes, it did. Jesus was crucified, AD 33, rose again three days later, walked the earth for 40 days, ascended into glory, but Jesus predicted that all that would happen. And then, not quite, you know, 40 years later, in AD 70, the city and the temple are destroyed, just like Jesus said, but even before Jesus said it, Daniel said it. He wrote it down because Gabriel, the angel, said it. Does that make sense? But this reference to the prince that shall come, the people of the prince that shall come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who is that prince? This is probably an allusion to the coming world ruler, also known as the Antichrist. The Antichrist. Now, we've talked about this often in our Revelation series, etc., but the Bible does declare that when Jesus comes back at the end of days, there will be a one-world government. The guy who rules over that, we often call the Antichrist, this coming world ruler. And the fact that his people will destroy the city and the sanctuary, that already happened, right? The Romans destroyed the city and the sanctuary in AD 70. That idea that the Antichrist his people will destroy the city and the sanctuary. If you recall our Revelation series, this is where we get the idea, if you've heard about it before, 
that in the end of days there will be a revived Roman Empire. Um, it's controversial. It's by no means ironclad or airtight. It's a possibility. Where do we get that idea? We get it from this passage. In other words, is Daniel saying here in Daniel chapter 9 the same people who destroyed the city and sanctuary in AD 70 are also the people that will give rise to the Antichrist? In other words, he will be ethnically Roman or European. Could be. It's a possibility. Uh, we can talk about that in more detail at another time. We already have, you know, in our past studies. We can talk about that if you've got more, you know, questions about that. But the point is, in verse 26, when it says, the people, the prince that shall come, the prince that shall come is a reference to the Antichrist. But it says that after, look at the last part of verse 26, that the Messiah will be cut off, the city will be destroyed, and then what happens after the city is destroyed? It says it will end with a flood. Or that is a reference to the flood, meaning the diaspora, the scattering, the spreading out of the nation. We call it the diaspora. That's when the Jewish nation was conquered in AD 70. They were then scattered to the ends of the earth. And it says, in the, under the end, the desolations are determined. In other words, verse 26 is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, and the destruction of the temple, and the Jewish diaspora. All right? All of that happened in A.D. 33, right, death of Jesus, up to A.D. 70, when the temple was destroyed and the nation was scattered. All right? So in other words, like I said before, verses 26 and 7, that's, or excuse me, Verses 25 and 6 is already history. That's already happened. Verse 27, on the other hand, hasn't happened yet. Let's talk about verse 27, and then we'll get back to Matthew. And then we'll sum it up, and we'll start taking questions here this morning. Daniel 9, verse 27, is talking about something that hasn't happened yet. Let's read it. It says, And he, which is referencing the prince, that shall come, that was the last antecedent, to use the big fancy you know, English word, but it's referencing the guy that it referenced back up in verse 26. In other words, the Antichrist, this coming world ruler who will rule over the world government, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. One week. That's the final week of years, seven years, of Gabriel's prophecy. In other words, this is where we get the idea. If you've ever heard of the idea of, of a seven-year tribulation time period, wh where do we get that idea? That the final you know, seven years of human history before Jesus comes back, are, it's called you know, the tribulation. Where do we get that idea that it'll be seven years? Right here. We get it from this idea in verse 27. It's talking about the final seven years of history that will fall upon the Jewish nation that hasn't happened yet. The Antichrist, it says, he, the prince that shall come, will confirm a covenant with the many, with Israel, for seven years. In the midst of those seven years, or halfway through the seven year time period, that's where we get the figure three and a half years. In the midst of those seven years, or three and a half years into the final seven years of human history, the Antichrist will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he will make it desolate. In other words, he will, and we'll talk about this more, well, we'll define it some more here today if you got some questions, and then we'll really deal with this more so next week. But the Antichrist will desecrate the Jewish temple. That's what it means when it says he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. What's the sacrifice and oblation? It's what's being offered up at a temple. So you need a temple in order to have sacrifices, in order for the Antichrist to desecrate the temple. That's what it's talking about here in verse 27. That's what Jesus is referencing in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. All right, but the point that I want you to see is that verse 27 hasn't happened yet. How do we know it hasn't happened yet? Because there's very clearly an interval between verses 26 and 7. Now, follow me here. I don't want to get confusing. I want to take this as slowly as I can. But 
some people will argue and they say, wait a minute, the 490 years that Gabriel talked about, it's already passed. Like, we're way past 490 years. That's true. But he notice what Gabriel does. He says the first 483 years, the first 69 weeks, will take you to the coming of Messiah. Boom, termination, pause. Then, during that time period, which is a span of at least 40 years, there in verse 26, he says, after Messiah comes, he will be destroyed, or cut off, Messiah will be cut off, the city will be destroyed, and the Jews will be scattered. That took at least 40 years to complete. In other words, there was a pause between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week. There's a pause there. There's an interval that Gabriel says, you know, he builds into his prophecy. This is what I'm trying to say. The point is, the 70th week, the final seven years of human history that we're looking for, hasn't happened yet. We're watching. We're waiting. What needs to happen before that 70 year, or that seven years, the 70th week of Daniel begins? What needs to happen? The Jewish need, people need to be gathered back into the land. They need to have a temple. There needs to be a one world government. There needs to be an antichrist who rules that one world government that makes a covenant with Israel for seven years before he violates that covenant. Does that make sense? In other words, there are prerequisites that need to be in place before verse 27 can be fulfilled literally. And it hasn't yet from human history. Not yet. But we might be getting close. That's kind of the whole point of our discussion here. So let me summarize this just briefly. Um, I kind of already talked about that, and, and we can come back and, and talk about the abomination of desolation. We're going to spend some more time working through that next week when he, the Antichrist, desecrates the Jewish temple. That is the moment that Jesus wants us to be watching for in Matthew 24, verse 15. But let me uh, summarize at the end of the verse. After he desecrates the temple... The Bible says at the end of verse 27 that this isn't going to last forever. In other words, this tyrant, the Antichrist, who will govern the world, who will uh, break his covenant with Israel, who will uh, violate and desolate the temple that will be standing at that time, and he will declare himself to be God, as, as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, um, this won't last forever. God will bring a judgment upon this person. And that's the, the point of the end of verse 27. That that which is determined, or what God has decreed to happen, the destruction of this coming world, world ruler, God will destroy him. This will be poured out upon the desolator. In other words, the Antichrist will be destroyed at the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is going to put him in his place, and we're going to have you know, the, the rule and reign of the Messiah. But let me summarize. I know, again, that's a, that, there's a lot. And if you've got specific questions, text them to Daniel. We're gonna, we can talk about them more specifically. But let me get just zoom back out. This is what we know from Daniel chapter 9. And then we're going back to Matthew 24. What Daniel, or excuse me, what Jesus will later label as in the Olivet Discourse as the tribulation is, what is also known as the latter half or the final three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. They're one and the same. They're synonyms. Daniel's 70th week is seven years, right? This That period when Daniel's 70th week begins, when this Antichrist signs a treaty with the covenant, you know, makes a covenant with the nation of Israel, this will begin the final seven years of human history. But that Antichrist will break his own covenant with the nation of Israel halfway in between. Three and a half years. He will desecrate the temple and he will begin persecuting the Jewish nation. That's what Jesus calls the Great Tribulation. But at the end of that time period, Jesus is coming back, the temple, or excuse me, the, the uh, Antichrist will be destroyed and Jesus wins. Right? That's the climax to human history. Now, up to our point in history, notice how much of Daniel's prophecy has already been fulfilled. 
Jesus, the Messiah, has already come. He was already put to death. The temple in Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem were already destroyed. The Jewish nation was scattered, dispersed. We call that the diaspora. That's already happened. And the Jewish people have already been regathered to the land. Well, it's going on right now. It started in the late 1800s through the early 1900s. The nation of Israel was de de declared as a sovereign nation in 1948. For many of you, this is review. But in 1948 of our era, the nation of Israel was declared as a sovereign nation. They were able to regain the city of Jerusalem and reoccupy the city of Jerusalem in 1967 as a result of the Six-Day War. And they haven't rebuilt a temple yet, but they're trying. In other words, from our perspective in history, the scene is set for verse 27, for, for the 70th week of Daniel to start, which is recorded and you know forecasted in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. The scene is already set. The nation of Israel is regathered in the land. They are recognized as a sovereign nation, and they haven't built a temple yet, but they're trying. Do you remember what we have talked about in the past, the Temple Mount Faithful, and there's other groups in Israel that have already, they're training priests, they've already built the temple furniture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They want to build a temple. I've, I've, I've seen their plans, right? I mean, they, they take you, their museum there in, in the old city of Jerusalem. They'll tell you all about their plans. And I went and took a tour of that when I was there in, in Israel a couple years ago. Really fascinating. But the point is, the Jewish nation wants to rebuild the temple. And it's on the docket. And as soon as they get the chance, they're going to do it. And so the point is, up to this point in history, much of Daniel chapter 9 has already been fulfilled. But Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 has not been fulfilled yet. We're waiting for that. We're watching for that. And it seems to be, right, this, the, I mean, we... It, it seems to be right around the corner in the sense that what needs to be in place for it to happen is already in place. It's really fascinating. Okay, so according, and this is what we're going to get into more next time, but according to, so go ahead and go back to Matthew 24. I just wanted to spend some time there in Daniel 9 so that you can understand what Jesus is referencing in Matthew 24, verse 15. But go back to Matthew 24, this is what is still ahead of us. Right now, we are living in a time that we're going to read it. Well, in fact, let's, let's just read it right now. Go back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and following. Let's read this section that Jesus calls the beginning of sorrows. This is the time period we're living in that will lead up unto the beginning of Daniel's 70th week or the final seven years of human history also known as the tribulation. All right, notice Matthew 24, verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, unto the disciples, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. You, uh, see that you be not troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Pause there. We're going to come back and comment on that in just a few moments, and then we'll wrap it up uh, and start taking questions. But what, Ma what Matthew 24 is going to talk about is that the beginning of sorrows, as you can see there on the screen, the beginning of sorrows describes the period of history from right now until the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. Until the Antichrist desolates the temple. That's the abomination of desolation. The signing of a treaty with Israel, when we have a one world government, because that's the Bible says we're heading there. Right? I mean, I, I know we, you know, it's not going to be pretty, but the Bible says we're heading there. So when there's a one world government, the guy who leads that, who we glibly call the Antichrist, will sign a treaty with the nation of Israel, which will last for seven years. That's the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. Halfway through that time period, he will commit the abomination 
of desolation, where he will desecrate the temple. He will go into the temple, cause sacrifices to cease, and he will declare himself to be God. The Antichrist will. And then, three and a half years after that event, Jesus comes back to take back his city, his temple, and to do away with the Antichrist. That's the climax of history. But where are we right now in this sequence of end times events? We are during, we're living in this period Jesus calls the beginning of sorrows. So what is that? Okay, give me 10 minutes to explain this, and then we'll take questions, all right? Do we have any questions coming in? Okay, we got a couple questions coming in. Great. So, the beginning of sorrows, what is this? The phrase that we just read in verse 8, when Jesus says, these things are the beginning of sorrows. The phrase beginning of sorrows is developing an idiom of birth pangs to refer to the end of the world. Just as birth pangs start suddenly, and I know all about this. Let me tell you. We've had six kids. Hasn't happened to me, obviously. Happened to my wife. Uh, but I went to birthing class. You know what I'm saying? All these midwives are telling you, gay husbands, watch out for this. As soon as your wife goes into labor and contractions start, this is what you do. You time the contractions. And then you time, you know, how long is that contraction? And then you time the time between the contractions. And you start looking for an increase in frequency and intensity. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh those of you who've been there, right? Daniel, you just, you know, you guys just had a baby, right? Um, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, well, you know, listen to me. The point is, just like birth pangs, they come suddenly upon a woman, but they start small. It's like, hmm, ah, you know, do I just have an upset stomach? You know, I just, I don't know if that's contraction. Hmm. Give it a, like an hour later. Oh, yeah, that's a contraction. You know, that's that's one for sure. And then you start timing it. Okay, how long did that tra contraction last? And how long in between those contractions? And as the contractions grow in intensity and grow in frequency, it means the birth is almost here. Right? That makes sense. So Jesus says, here are some signs that are like birth pangs. Be watching for these because these will grow in intensity and frequency and as they do, the, the end is approaching. Okay? Makes sense. So that's what Jesus gives us to look for. These signs that we are to be looking for include rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. As those things occur around the globe and they increase in frequency and intensity, then just like labor pains signal a new, new birth coming, these signs are signaling the end of the day, or, you know, the end of time, the end of days, which will bring a new world, a new, you know, new, new uh, order when Jesus comes back ultimately and he sets up his kingdom, etc., but these signs, Jesus says, will grow in frequency and intensity as we near the end. It's the beginning of sorrows, the labor pains. Has this happened? Well, think about it. Jesus says, nation will rise against nation and then kingdom, of king kingdom will rise against kingdom. The time period in which we live, from when Jesus spoke these words all the way up into the present day, has been characterized by war. We have seen an increase throughout history of the frequency of wars and the intensity of wars. First, it, sp it starts nation against nation. That, that just simply refers to smaller scale localized wars between neighbors. But that soon grew, did it not? To kingdom going against kingdom. That's what you and I might call the world wars. We've had two so far in history. We might have more, right? We might have a third world war, a fourth world war. Well, you know, I don't know, but we will have global conflicts where war is growing in its frequency. They're closer together and they're more intense. More people are involved, more people die. That has happened in history. We're watching it happen. But not only are we to watch out for wars, but also famines, Jesus says. A famine also often results from war, panic, pestilence, or you know, other things of various kinds. 
For instance, locust plagues, pandemics, the ravages of war will bring about food shortages, famines. Uh, I don't know if you all know this, but there is the largest locust plague that has occurred in generations, like decades, that is right now hitting huge parts of Africa and the Middle East. And it's rather fascinating. We have a church uh, that's kind of loosely associated with us in the sense that they can, you know, there's a church in Kenya, Africa that we are in touch with because they found us online. They use our website. They use the teaching of Ruby Mountain Bible Church in their church. Uh, and it's really exciting what the Lord's doing over there with that church. And they're really growing there in Kenya. Uh, it's kind of exciting. But what's happening there is is they just told me the other day that they're being plagued with the locust plague. They're, they're having major food shortages over there uh, because of the locust plague that's hitting there. Uh, the point is, Jesus said, just like birth pangs will grow in frequency and intensity, so too will these signs as we approach the end of days. Famines will become more common, more widespread. Not only famines, but he says pestilence which is the Greek word loimos, which can be translated pestilence or plague. It can refer to a disease, an epidemic, or a pandemic. Are you, have you ever seen one of those? A pandemic. Have you seen one of those recently? The point is, these will increase in frequency and intensity as the, near, as the end of times nears us, as we you know, get closer to the end of times. Also, Jesus says, earthquakes will become more frequent and more intense all over the world. Now, <laughs> it was kind of fascinating. Have you heard of an earthquake recently? Right? I've had like half a dozen of you people uh, text me and ask me, hey, how's your family doing? How are your brothers doing? How are your parents doing? We heard a hearth, you know, an earthquake hit Salt Lake City. And you know, it's kind of fascinating that all of this stuff is happening simultaneously. Um, but shouldn't be surprised by that. Jesus said it would be this way as we get closer to the end. So, I'm going to just reproduce for you really briefly here a list that was compiled by Arnold Frichtenbaum. He's a end times, you know, prophecy scholar, and that well illustrates this point. Now, I got to give a caveat to this, and he does too. Obviously, the record of earthquakes throughout history is far from complete. Our sensory technology has become more highly developed, and you know, we're better able to record when earthquakes happen. But nonetheless, this list that, that is compiled by Arnold Frichtenbaum is rather fascinating in that it shows throughout history, from Jesus till now, we have a very steady and then a steep rise in earthquakes around the globe. Let me just reproduce that for you briefly. According to Frichtenbaum, the first thousand years of history after Jesus, we only have five recorded earthquakes in human history. There may have been more that were just unrecorded, but... Uh, best we can tell, there's only five recorded in history significant enough to be recorded in the first thousand years after Jesus. But by the time we get to the 14th century AD, our era, there was 157 earthquakes. The 15th century saw 174 earthquakes. The 16th century saw 253 earthquakes. The 17th century saw 278 earthquakes. The 18th century spiked a little bit. We got up to 640 earthquakes. The 19th century spiked again for over 2,000 earthquakes. There were 2,119. But then the 20th century, last century, right? We're talking 1900s. There were over nine, or there were right around 900,000 earthquakes recorded in the 20th century the 1900s. Do you see a significant, you know, spike in the frequency and intensity of earthquakes? Yes. Is that coincidence? No. God, you know, Jesus said it would be this way. The end is not yet, but we are nearing the end as these things happen more frequently with greater intensity, etc. Does that make sense? We are seeing the, the end approach, just like Jesus said would happen. So, all of these elements, the famines, earthquakes, pestilence, pandemics, epidemics, etc., all of these elements will be present and increasing during our age, but they will climax during the 70th week of Daniel, which will begin when the Antichrist signs that treaty with the nation of Israel for seven years. Right? And we'll talk about that more next week. I'm just going to wrap it up for today. 
uh, here in just a moment, we'll, and we'll take the questions that have come in, uh, and then, then we'll call it a day. But all of these, el these elements, famine, war, earthquake, pestilence, will be a standard for our era, but they're going to get worse and worse, closer together, more frequent, more intense, until they climax. For instance, if you read the book of Revelation, Revelation 6 and 7, when that final seven-year period starts, the 70th week of Daniel, then all these elements will even get worse, more intense. The, so bad, it says the, the world will have never seen such disaster. So, in other words, our pandemic is small stuff compared to what's coming, according to what the Bible says. But we shouldn't be surprised that there are pandemics, earthquakes, famines, etc., because the Bible says this would happen as we approach the end. All right, so next time, next week, we're going to get more detailed into looking at uh, more specifically the abomination of desolation, looking a little bit more at this coming world order that the Bible says, the one world government that the Bible talks about. Uh, in other words, we will talk more about what the Bible says we should watch out for as the end approaches. But for now, let's take your questions. There's a couple questions that have come in. Let's address those uh, with as much you know detail as we can, and then we'll call it a day for today. All right, so fire away, Daniel. What's our, what's our first question here? Oh, thank you, sir. All right, so just starting top to bottom. These are the questions as they come in. Um, first question, do you believe that the Antichrist will be Roman? Do you believe the Antichrist will be Roman? Um, this is kind of, this is a great question. It's been controversial throughout the ages because it all hinges on how you read Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 when it says, the prince, the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, it, it all depends on that phrase, really. I mean, there's some other passages that are at play, but that's the big one. What does it mean when the Bible says, the people of the prince that shall come? The prince that shall come is clearly a reference to the Antichrist. But the people of the prince that shall come, who destroyed the city and the sanctuary in AD 70, is that phrase referring to the fact that the Antichrist will be ethnically the same as the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? Maybe. Um, that has been the traditional view. Uh, that is why so many people talk about the revived Roman Empire. They also are dealing with prophecies from Daniel chapters 2 and 7. But the idea that the final world empire will be you know, that is the empire, the one world government over which the Antichrist rules. The idea that that will be a revived Roman Empire has dominated a lot of church history uh, as people have interpreted this passage. And they say, yeah, maybe that idea, the fact that the Romans destroyed the city in AD 70, is a clue to what the ethnicity of the Antichrist actually will be. Or others will interpret that instead of saying it's his ethnicity, it's simply his uh, the government over which he will rule. That he might be, uh, uh, you know, ethnically from who knows, but he will rule over a revived Roman Empire. In other words, the nation of Israel or the nations of the world will come back together in a global, one-world government, and the center of power will be Rome the city of Rome, or at least Europe. And that will be the center of power over which the anti Antichrist rules. To be fair, let me throw in another couple of views here that you know we can talk about this in much more detail in the future if we ever, by God's grace, do a study of the book of Daniel. But others, there's, there's a pretty wide growing movement right now that they're critiquing the traditional view that the Antichrist will be Roman, of Roman descent, or will rule over a revived Roman Empire. And there's actually a growing belief right now that the one world order in the end will actually be a worldwide Islamic caliphate. Now, it's pretty involved. Uh, we could really get lost in this for a while to talk through why they believe that and where they get those ideas. It's kind of fascinating. <laughs> 
but it is a possibility. So the point is, to answer the question, will the Antichrist be Roman? We don't know. Possibly. Maybe. Um, church history has, has long favored that view for a variety of reasons, largely because of the dominance of the Catholic Church, for instance. That when the Protestant Reformation took place and the Protestants broke away from the Catholics, they read that in the Bible, the coming Antichrist, the world ruler, the, you know, that the, the, um, uh, the Antichrist would be the Pope, that he would be the uh, spiritual and political ruler of the world that is literally associated with the city of Rome. And so that's kind of been the traditional view, but there's been a lot of modern critique of that view, and it's a good question. We'll see, in other words. The Bible's not definitive on that as far as you know who, what the ethnicity of the Antichrist will be. All right, next question. Matthew 24, 22. Okay, Matthew 24, 22. Does this point to a pre-tribulational rapture? And then also another question that just came in that relates, where is the rapture in this sequence? Okay, so i uh, got two questions that are related on the rapture. The first, the first question is when will the rapture happen? You know, when is the rapture in this sequence of end times events? Where will it fall? And then the other question was more specifically regarding Matthew twenty four twenty two, asking if this was a is a way to support the pre trib rapture. And let me just read that verse for you. Matthew twenty four twenty two says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. In other words, this might be, verse 22, might be a reference to the rapture. Uh, it's, it's inconclusive for a variety of reasons because that's, that verse can also be appropriately interpreted as a reference to simply persecution in general. Like if, not just persecution, but... Um, you know, the worldwide disasters that are going to be taking place during those final years, right before Jesus comes back, they're going to be so intense that if they weren't shortened, in other words, if, if Jesus didn't say the worst of it is only going to be three and a half years, then I'm coming back. If those weren't shortened, in other words, what if those three and a half years and the intensity of that lasted for 10 years, 20 years, if it wasn't shortened, there would be no life left on the earth. That's what he's saying. So it can refer possibly to the rapture, or it can just simply refer to, you know, the overall death toll in the tribulation period coming from a variety of angles, you know, or reasons why the death toll is so high. But the issue of the rapture is something that is, uh, it's really worth, maybe we, uh, let me give you a short answer now, and then maybe we can deal with this more next week in more detail. So let me give you a short answer now, a longer answer next week. The rapture is, first of all, affirmed that it will happen. There's three primary passages in the Bible that affirm for us the rapture, which is defined as a catching away, that we as the believers in Jesus Christ, the saints of God, we will be Raptured, And it actually it comes from a Greek word, harpazo, in 1 Thessalonians 4, that talks about we will be caught up, that we will be rescued out from this, um, this horrendous time, that we will go to meet Jesus in the air. The rapture is uh, something that is affirmed by the Bible, clearly the New Testament, in three passages. John 14, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 1 Corinthians 15. However, none of those passages are clear on when the rapture will happen. The Bible is very clear that the rapture will happen, but it is less clear on when the rapture will happen. As a result of this, there has been a bunch of views that have surfaced through history. There is the pre-tribulational view. That means they believe that the rapture will happen before the seven years of, you know, the final seven years of human history even starts. And so that that's the next thing on the world, you know, on the prophetic timeline. That's what the pre-tribulation rapture uh, teaches. 
there's lots of reasons for that and there's evidences for that and then we can discuss those perhaps next week secondly however you know you have other views that say well it'll happen sometime in those seven years that maybe it'll happen halfway through maybe it'll happen you know and there's a lot of debate on this and there's very varying positions the mid-trib view the the pre-wrath view there's variations of those views that that try to say well the the tribulation that seven year tribulation time period the rapture will occur somewhere in there and they have again a bunch of different arguments for that and then there's the post-trib view that teaches that we Christians will go through the entire tribulation time. We'll be here the whole time, unless we die in the middle of it, you know, because of persecution or whatever. We will go through the entirety of that period, and we will only be raptured at the very end. When Jesus comes back, we will be caught up to him in the air as he's coming back, you know, as he's coming down to earth. And that that's when the rapture will happen. So to summarize, and we'll get into it more next week, the, to summarize, the Bible does declare that the rapture will happen. And again, those three places are your key passages. John 14, 1 Thessalonians 1, or no, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 1 Corinthians 15. But the Bible is less clear on when it will happen. So we can articulate those arguments pro and con uh, maybe more next time to get a little deeper into that question. But good question. All right. What's our next one here? Um, so, since there has been no sacrificial system since AD 70, temple destruction, what does the Jewish community say about how they are going to resume that sacrifice system in the new temple? Again, let me read that again. Since there has been no sacrificial system since AD 70, and that's true, right? This temple was destroyed. By the Romans in AD 70, there, have not, there has not been a standing Jewish temple since. Then the question is, what does the Jewish community say about how they're going to resume the sacrificial system in the new temple? So, great question. Um, it is broadly, I mean, I'm sure there are people within the Jewish community that would say, you know, answer that differently. But my understanding is that you know, some don't even look for it. You know, your secular Jews that don't even care about the Bible, they don't care about the prophecy, they're not even looking for it. They don't even care. Um, you know, when I was over in Israel, I was riding a train and I was talking to a Jew and there was a lady there that, you know, we were kind of asking about some of these things and, and she was a little bit of the mind that, you know what, I don't really care. Like, I don't, you know, people talk about that stuff and she's like, I, I couldn't care less. So that's the response of some Jews. But the Jews that are orthodox, they're serious about the Bible. They're serious about starting up the temple again. Um, their ultimate goal is to take control of the Temple Mount and to rebuild a temple so that they can restart the sacrificial system. And that's why they have furniture built. That's why they have priests trained, etc. Um but the problem is, it's a political hot button. Because when the Jews came into the land, and this is a really, I'm trying to summarize, this is a really long history. But when the Jews came back in the land, there was this, obviously, tension between the Jews that came in and the present Muslim population that was there. Um, the Muslims have controlled the Temple Mount, where the old temple once stood and where the Jews want to build the new temple is the Temple Mount. It's where currently the Dome of the Rock stands, if you're familiar with that. The Muslim Mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, as well as the Dome of the Rock Shrine, both sit on the present day Temple Mount. But the Jews want to capture the Temple Mount and control it. Technically, they did back in 1967. After the Six-Day War, the Jews controlled it. They drove out the, the, the Muslims. They, the Muslims fled the, the scene. The Jews recaptured it, and they controlled the Temple Mount, but only for like, oh, I forget, it's only a few weeks of, that they controlled it. And then, in order to appease their Muslim, the Muslim population around them, they decided to give the Temple Mount back to the, to the Muslim. It's called the Waqf, which is, I think it's W-A-Q-F, which is the uh, Muslim authority that controls the Temple Mount right now. 
and the Jewish nation gave it back to the Muslims basically to appease them. Well, it, you know, it, it's so, in other words, right now the Jews aren't allowed on the Temple Mount. Uh, to this day, Jews can't go up there. They can go to the Western Wall, which is, you know, below the Temple Mount, but they're not allowed up on top. And so, how is this going to go down in human history? We don't know. There's several theories. Some will say another war is going to break out. The Jews are going to kick out the Muslims again, but this time they won't give the Temple Mount back. They'll tear down you know, the Muslim mosque and the Muslim Dome of the Rock Shrine, and they'll rebuild a new temple right there. That's one possibility. Others think, they, again, Daniel chapter 9, the Antichrist who will make a covenant with the nation of Israel. What's that covenant going to be about? We don't know. Will it be border security? Will it be economic covenant? We don't know. Some think he will make the covenant to allow the, the, the Jews to rebuild their temple. In other words, he will be the most politically savvy person history's ever seen, and he will be able to bring peace to the Middle East, which, by the way, every major American administration has tried for the last you know, several decades to bring peace to the Middle East, to try and figure out a resolution between you know, the Jews and the Muslims there. And so some think it will be diplomatically worked out that the Antichrist will help them get along and the, the Muslims will allow the Jews to build a temple right there next to the Dome of the Rock. Maybe. I kind of see that one as unlikely, but it's a possibility. So, But the Jewish people, they don't want to build a temple anywhere else other than the, the top of that Temple Mount where the old temple once stood. So that's the only place they're willing to do it. And how that happens, we'll see You know, in history, whether it happens militarily, diplomatically, whatever. Um, that's, that's where they want to rebuild. And when they do rebuild, they're going to start the sacrifices again. So, next question. Um, when in this outline might that happen? The it related question with the new temple being built. Yeah, great question. When will, in the timeline, the question is, when in the timeline will this temple be rebuilt? We don't know. It apparently will be standing during those last seven years because at least it will be standing during, let me clarify that, it will be standing during the last three and a half years. Why do we know that? Because there has to be a temple for the abomination of desolation to happen, right? There has to be a temple that has an active sacrificial system that the Antichrist comes in to shut down the sacrificial system, to hijack the temple, to walk into the temple, and to, to declare himself as God. There has to be a temple standing. But Jesus says, and Daniel said, that will happen halfway through the final seven years. So, the last you know three and a half years of human history is when that's going to happen. So, the temple has to be standing before then. But other than that, that's the only answer that we have. We don't know when it will be built prior to that. Uh, it, might, it might be built before the seven years starts, or as some have theorized, it's the, the covenant that the Antichrist will make with the Jewish people may involve the sacrifices. Because it says he will break the covenant when he causes the sacrifices to cease. So that might imply that when the sacrifices started, that that was the point of the covenant to begin with. Does that make sense? I mean, it's a possibility. So it might not be standing until the Antichrist says, okay, here, now you can build. You know, he, he that's part of the covenant that he makes with Israel. Israel starts building, they have it built and in operation within three and a half years before the Antichrist comes in later to desecrate it. But that's the best answer I can give. We know by when it should be built, but that's the only real biblical indicator. Go ahead, give me the next one. Can you outline the difference between the first abomination standing in the Holy of Holies and the last one? Yes, so the first one and the last one. Okay, so the abomination of desolation. Uh, this was going to be part of our topic more so next week. So again, let me give you a short answer and uh, we'll, we can detail it a little bit more next time. But... The question was, can we? Can I outline the difference between the first abomination of desolation and the second? So, for those of you who are aware of this, the abomination of desolation 
is simply a phrase that means the desecrating of the temple. In other words, if you're familiar with the book of Leviticus and how the temple is supposed to operate, once a temple is built and it's sanctified and the sacrifices are going, then they have to continue to those sacrifices to keep this temple pure and clean and the presence of God in the midst of the people. So to desecrate the temple means to cease the sacrifices, to walk into the holy place when no one was supposed to do that, recall. And it could also mean, and I think most uh, literally means, when I say abomination of desolation, the word abomination is also sometimes translated idol. So a literal idol, a statue that is set up in the holy of holy places in the temple, which is a desecration. That's, you know, God said no statues, right? No idols and etc. So the abomination of desolation is when an idol is set up inside of the temple and the temple of Yahweh is no longer dedicated exclusively to Yahweh. It's been desecrated by an abomination, an idol. Does that make sense? Okay, that has happened a bunch in Hebrew history. If you go read your Old Testament, um, you have wicked kings like Ahaz and, and Manasseh and you know some of these guys that they did. They desecrated the temple. They set up an idol inside the Jewish temple. And it was an abomination. But Daniel, when Daniel prophesies that that will happen, then he is saying, because remember when Daniel gave that prophecy, the abomination of desolation, you know, they, or the temple, there was no temple standing in Daniel's day when he gave that prophecy because the, the temple had been destroyed by Babylon, you know, 70 years earlier. So Daniel foretold of a time that there would be another temple standing and it would be defiled. Okay, fast forward in history. What happens after Daniel? Okay, Ezra, Nehemiah, children of Israel go back, reclaim the land, rebuild the temple. What happened to that temple? Are you familiar with the Maccabean Revolt? Remember this? It takes place in between the Testaments. So after Malachi is over and Matthew begins, that time period we call the 400 silent years. The Bible doesn't record it, but it's recorded in the books of Maccabees. What happened was there was a Syrian king, Syria, S-Y-R-A-I-N, I-A-N, Syrian. A Syrian king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, that goes in and he desecrates the Jewish temple. He slaughters a pig on the altar and he um, sets up a statue, an idol of Zeus inside the holy place. So that is an abomination of desolation. So some scholars will say, oh, it's already been fulfilled. Daniel's prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 has already been fulfilled. The, the, the temple was built and you know the uh, it was desecrated by an abomination. And then of course if you know the story, as soon as the Antiochus Epiphanes does that, the Jewish people revolt. And that's called the Maccabean Revolt, led by a guy by the name of Judas Maccabeus. And he and his brothers and the armies of, of Israel that he's able to kind of rally together, the militia, are able to overthrow the Syrians, reclaim the temple. This takes place in 167 BC. So we're talking before Jesus is ever born. 167 BC, they reclaim the temple, they rededicate the temple. And they still celebrate that to this day. It's called the Feast of Hanukkah, the event where the Maccabees reclaim the temple. But here's my point. Some will say, wait then, it's already been fulfilled. Wait, 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 wait. Jesus comes on the scene. Matthew 24. He comes on the scene 167 you know, years later. Well, he's giving this lecture, the Olivet Discourse in AD 33. So we're talking almost 200 years later. Jesus steps on the scene and he says that there will be another abomination of desolation. Does that make sense? In other words, what happened before Jesus in the Maccabean Revolt did not ultimately fulfill Daniel chapter 9, according to Jesus. Jesus says, watch. Does that make sense? Because he's 200 years after that event, 
And he's still saying, watch, because this is the event that you need to be watching for that will mark the last three and a half years of human history. And so it's something still future to Jesus. Well, what happened? Okay, let me give you one more little tidbit and then we'll move on. What happened after Jesus? So Jesus, you know, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, Jesus is gone. The temple stands for 40 years after Jesus. What happened in those 40 years? Was the abomination of desolation, did it occur? Almost. <laughs> it did not, but it almost did. And it's a fascinating story. Josephus talks about it. There's a, you know, the Caligula, you know, Caligula, emperor Caligula. The guy was insane. He was a nuts guy. Caligula was a guy who started declaring himself to be God. He also ordered that a statue of himself would be set up in the Jewish temple. He ordered that to take place. But it didn't happen. He died before the order was carried out. And the Jews wouldn't let it happen. And so the point is, it almost happened, but it didn't. What Jesus said would happen, an idol, an abomination, set, being set up in the temple to desecrate the temple, that hasn't happened um, since you know, the, the days of Jesus. So in other words, we're still looking for that. So to be fair, there have been more than one abomination of desolations, but the one that Jesus talked about and told us to look for hasn't happened yet. So that's what we're waiting for. All right. Why are the 69 weeks divided into 7 and 62? Okay, excellent question. I didn't take the time to address that. The, the question is, why in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 50 or 25, rather, why are the 69 weeks divided, subdivided? Instead of just saying 69 weeks, why is it saying seven weeks and then 62 weeks? You add those together, we get 69. But why is it subdivided? Um, best answer for that is that the seven weeks takes you to the completion of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. Because remember, reread verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem... Unto the Messiah, the Prince, will be seven weeks, which probably is, that's what takes from the going forth of the commandment to the ultimate rebuilding and restoration of the city. That took about 49 years, right? That's your seven weeks. But then 62 weeks after that, we have Messiah coming into town, all right, into the restored city of Jerusalem. So that's probably why it's subdivided. That's a great question. I didn't take the time to go to that, you know, when we worked through it. So glad you caught that. But that's probably why it's subdivided. One's talking about the finishing of the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. And the other, the 62 weeks, is talking about from the rebuilding of Jerusalem to the triumphal entry. That would be 62 weeks. So, Going back to the rapture, can the rapture occur now? Or are they still, un or are there still unfulfilled events yet to be fulfilled. Okay, so back to the rapture. A question is, can the rapture happen right now? Or are there unfulfilled events that need to take place before the rapture happens? So, great question, but again, it goes back to the basic issue. The Bible does declare in three very specific places that there will be a rapture, but it's less clear on when. So, We'll get into this more next week, but depending on how you interpret some of those passages, then that will answer your question. Some will say, no, there's nothing in place. You know, nothing, no prerequisite that needs to happen before the rapture occurs. And so that's the next thing on the calendar. And that could very well be. But there's a couple of passages, depending on how you read them, it will bring you to a different conclusion. And so people will say, no, there's actually several things that need to take place before the rapture happens. So there, that is a great question. It is not easily settled. Uh, it's probably one of the most divisive questions, you know, confusing questions. Um, so again, hold on to that. We will get more into that next time when we will hash through some of the arguments, pros and cons for the timing of the rapture. But what do we got next? Um, Rome. Couldn't the prophecy of the return of Rome 
to produce the Antichrist refer to the Catholic Church, and the political power of the Pope is, gain, is gaining in each generation. Could this be the future Antichrist? Um, so yes, like I said, that's the traditional view, the, is that the return of Rome, and again, it's not, it is a, it's the traditional view in the sense that it's been most widely held for the longest period of time in church history, but it, it's not ironclad. There's ways around that. But it is a classic view that the return of Rome and the Antichrist is actually a reference to the Roman Catholic Church. The Protestant reformers taught this. Um, not to get lost in this, but you all know what the Geneva Bible is. If you don't, Google it. But the Geneva Bible was translated by Calvin and, and a bunch of reformers in, in Geneva, Switzerland. And it's the first Bible study Bible in all human history with notes, study notes. Like they published the translation and study notes with the translation. Well, in the study notes of the Geneva Bible, they talk about this. They, they interpret these passages as, you know, the Antichrist as being the Pope, the renewed Roman Empire as being the Catholic Church. And it's, it's kind of funny. You can go back and still read those. But the point is that that has been a wide whole, widely held view for a long period of time. And it makes sense. There's a lot of modern people that hold to this. I've recommended this book before, but Dave Hunt, H-U-N-T, Dave Hunt wrote a book called The Woman Rides the Beast. The Woman Rides the Beast. And he is, it's an exposition well, it, it's it's kind of an exposition, exposition of, of Revelation 17, but he is holding and defending the view that the end time government, the one world government, the one world ruler, the Antichrist at the head of it all, will be the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. And according to the, you know, the comment made in the question is that the political power of the Pope is gaining in each generation. And that's true. The, the Catholic Church, if you're not aware of this, Catholic Church is one of the most powerful entities on the planet. And so it does make, you know, a lot of sense to say that they will either be or at least be a tool in the hands of this one world, you know, the coming one world government and the Antichrist. It could have, it, it's definitely a possibility. Uh, but like I said before, there's a growing movement, even amongst really conservative scholars, to interpret some of those same passages rather than being a revived Roman Empire. There's a big movement now, growing movement, to interpret it as an established uh, Islamic caliphate and it's really a fascinating you know to be honest I mean I'm, I'm exposed to these the caliphate view I've dabbled in it a little bit I'm much more familiar with the old school Roman view um, but you know it, we'll see as time goes on and my studies continue to evolve and we have opportunities to address these topics in the future um, you know we will dabble more and more into some of those different views but yes, in answer to your question, it is a definite possibility that the Pope will be the, the Antichrist and the Roman Catholic Church will in some way play a huge role in this coming world order. Um, next question says, during the end times, end of times, isn't there an empire returning? Would it be the Roman Empire based on the possible Roman world leader or could it still be a different one such as Babylon? Again, <clears throat> that's another question. Uh, along the same lines of what I just mentioned is, you know, the prophecy that, and let me, let me just allude to this briefly. And again, maybe we can dive more into this. I'm, I'm making a list of what we need to address more fully next week, but in Daniel chapter two and seven, particularly chapter two, you have the vision of the, um, the idol Remember this? It's the metallic image. It's a dream that Nebuchadnezzar has that is basically, he has a, meta he has a vision, a dream of, of an, an image that has four metals that represent four governments, four coming world governments. And the uh, Daniel, the prophet Daniel, goes to interpret this dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And he, and he makes some interesting comments. And the whole debate of the revived Roman Empire, like, is that going to happen? You know, it's largely connected to how you interpret this, um, this, this dream, this vision. So, <clears throat> for instance, 
in Daniel chapter 2, and, and maybe we can get into this in more detail later. How many more questions have we got? Three more? Okay, all right. Maybe I can give a quick brief, brief synopsis, and then uh, we can just answer the three more. And I don't want to wear you all out. I know we've been going for a little while. But, um, but in Daniel chapter 2, the vision, verse 31, says, And thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before you, in the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, its, its breast and arms were silver, its belly and thighs of brass, its legs of iron, and its feet part of iron, part of clay. You saw until that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them in pieces. Then was the iron and the clay, and the brass and the silver and the gold, broken in pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's the dream. Now what happens next is Daniel interpreting that dream. So this is where we have to, you know, figure out what Daniel's saying. Verse 36, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Verse 37, thou, O king, so this is Daniel speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the, the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of Israel, or excuse me, the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given unto your hand, and hath made you the ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. All right, that's pretty clear. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, this image represents four coming kingdoms. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are the, the head of gold. So the Babylonian Empire was the head of gold. Okay, verse 39. After thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to you, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these, it shall break in pieces and bruise. All right, so the next, he gives us just in, not a lot of comment here, but he gives three more kingdoms. After Babylon, you have a second kingdom, a third kingdom, and then he says a fourth kingdom. So it's all about how do we interpret these four kingdoms? Um... Then, look at verse 41. He says, Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas you saw iron mixed with miry clay... They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. That's the reference to the coming of Jesus, the setting up of the millennial kingdom. That's the end of age, is verse 44. And he says, and the kingdom will not be left to other people, but it'll break in pieces and consume all the other kingdoms, and it will stand forever. So here's the question. Daniel says there will be, starting with Nebuchadnezzar, there's going to be four kingdoms. Then there's going to be a fifth kingdom that is an offshoot of the fourth kingdom. Okay? Again, this is, we could spend a lot of time expositing this passage, but are you sticking with me? He says the first one is a head of gold. The second kingdom has breast and arms of silver. Uh, then you have a belly and thighs of bronze. There's your third kingdom. Then you have the fourth kingdom is iron. Then you have kind of the sprig, the offshoot. The fourth kingdom has two legs of iron, he says, but then there's like an offshoot of it. There's, there's, a, there's feet with ten toes that are part iron, part clay. So the point is, it's somehow associated with the fourth kingdom, but it's, it's a new sprig. It's a new offshoot of that, that fourth kingdom. It's kind of the fourth kingdom reimagined, or as some will say, revived. But here's the problem. How do we identify those four kingdoms? The first one, no problem. That's Babylon. Second one, who takes over after Babylon, if you know your history? Well, this is colored in for us in another vision in Daniel. Daniel chapter uh, 8, for instance, tells us that Babylon will fall to Medo-Persia. So the second kingdom is Medo-Persia. Who will take over after the Medo-Persians. Greece, 
Again, Daniel 8 makes that clear for us. But who's the fourth kingdom? The fourth kingdom that will, you know, have its offshoot. It, it's two legs, but it'll have ten toes later. That is kind of a, a, a uh, an offshoot of that fourth kingdom. Who is that kingdom? The Bible doesn't say. The traditional view is it's Rome. Because after you have Babylon fall, Medo-Persia takes over. After Medo-Persia falls, you have Greece. After Greece falls, it's Rome. And so Rome is that fourth kingdom, which means the ten toes that come out of the two legs will be a revived Roman Empire. All right? That's kind of your classic traditional interpretation of these passages. But like I said, there's a really huge growing movement that is interpreting this differently. And it's saying that fourth, because Rome is nowhere, nowhere mentioned in the book of Daniel, though Greece is. And some scholars today will combine Greece and Rome as the third kingdom. In other words, the first kingdom was Babylon, the second kingdom was Medo-Persia. The third kingdom was the Greco-Roman kingdom. That's the way they argue. Which, they have lots of arguments for that, and it's, it's appealing in some ways. Because we, even from a historic standpoint, often combine the Greco-Roman era, and we call it the classical era. Because the Greco, you know, Rome was a lot more Greek than Roman in a lot of ways. The Romans conquered the Greeks militarily, but culturally they were more Greek than uh, they were Roman. And so many scholars now are saying the third kingdom is the Greco-Roman kingdom. So then who's the fourth kingdom? That will then become, you know, the, the fifth kingdom as well. The fourth and fifth are combined, right? It's a similar kingdom. It's that's where they come in and they say it's the Islamic Caliphate. That it's, it's actually the rise of Islam that is that fourth kingdom that will ultimately emerge into the, you know, the fifth kingdom. And that will be the kingdom in place when Jesus comes back. So it's, it's like I said, a lot of arguments, boy, we could get on. But it's all hinges on how you interpret those four kingdoms. Who are they? Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome? Or Babylon, Persia... Greco-Rome and Islam, right? That's kind of your big, you know, two big camps right now in evangelical, you know, interpretation of those those visions. But, all right, go ahead. Let's let's tackle another one. When I googled who Roman people are today, it said Italian. Do you think that's correct? Um. So, well, yeah, ethnically speaking, yeah. When you Google who is the Roman people it comes out Italian. And that's that's true. Ethnically speaking, they are um, the, the modern country of Italy, the Italian ethnicity, would be the modern equivalent of ancient Rome. Um, so, but again, people will go back and forth on Rome. You know, is that talking, when it talks about Rome, uh, is that talking about ethnically or politically and we could get lost in this but the whole idea is when when people say the you know the people the prince that will come destroy the city and the sanctuary is that talking about the romans ethnic ethnically or the romans politically in other words even late in the roman empire they were no longer the roman military was no longer roman uh, ethnically speaking they were a mix mash of germans and franks and you know all these other people. And so a lot of people, that's why a lot of scholars have said that Rome, late in the game, when the Roman Empire was about to fall in the 400s AD, they were less Roman than they were a mixture of all what would become European countries, like Germany, France, Italy, Spain, on the list goes. And the point is, when it says Roman, what does that mean? Is it talking about the ethnic Roman? That would be the Italian. Or is it talking about the Roman that fell underneath the political umbrella of Rome? That could be basically a shorthand way of referring to Europeans. You know, I mean, it could be anybody in Europe because they were all associated with the, with ancient Rome, you know, right when Rome was about to fall. So again, that's where, you know, we'll see. But that's what we're dealing with when we come to prophecy in general. Prophecy hasn't happened yet. And so as a result, we kind of look at the trajectory of what God says is going to happen. 
but a lot of the details are fuzzy and uh, that's okay God designed it that way because if he gave us every single detail in that would satisfy our curiosity, we would quit trusting in him. <laughs> so God doesn't do that. He gives us just enough detail to say, okay, this is what's coming. And when it does come, we can have confidence that God does, you know, that God knew what would happen beforehand. But he doesn't give us every single detail either because he still wants us to trust in him. So, um, man, good question. But some of that will be, we'll see, you know, as this unfolds couple more questions. Okay, let's do two more. Without the sacrificial system in place now for the Jewish people, how do they believe they have the forgiveness of sins <laughs> without the shedding of blood? Great question. Okay, so to repeat the question, without the sacrificial system in place for the Jewish nation, how does a Jew, a modern Jew, an Orthodox Jew, say they have forgiveness of sins? In other words, didn't you need the sacrifices and the shedding of blood in order to have forgiveness of sins? That's what the Bible says. Well, without a Jewish temple where they can have sacrifices, then there are there's no bloodshed, there's no sacrifice. So how does the modern Jew overcome their sin? How do they find forgiveness? Great question. Okay, so this is the crux of what separates a Jew and a Christian. This is the book of Hebrews. Because a Christian says, we don't need it. We don't need a temple. Why? Because Jesus was sacrificed in our place. He is the once for all offering. We don't need a temple anymore because it was a one-time sacrifice by Jesus that has eternal efficacy. He only needed to be offered once. Game over, right? We don't need a temple. That's the answer a Christian will give as well as a Messianic Jew. But what about an Orthodox Jew? An Orthodox Jew rejects Jesus as the Messiah. They do not believe in the sacrifice of Jesus, but they still need sacrifices. So what do they do? Well, this is what happened. Historically, and it happened after the destruction of the temple in AD 70, if you watch Judaism, modern Judaism, as you and I are familiar with it, didn't exist in the first century. Not in the same way. Why? Because they had a temple. But when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, there was a guy, and if I remember his name correctly, his name was Yohanan ben Zakkai, John the son of Zakkai. Yohanan ben Zakkai was a Jew who was commissioned to try and re, uh, basically renovate Judaism absent the temple. In other words, he tried to answer the exact same question that you just asked. How do we as Jews find forgiveness for our sins without a sacrificial system? How do we do it? Well, this is what Benjamin or Yohanan ben Zakkai and his followers after him started doing, and then it evolved over a period of several centuries. But this is basically what they did. They said, we don't have a sacrifice, but what we're going to do is substitute what we would do for a sacrifice we will substitute a sacrifice with our good deeds. With the giving of alms, with the offering up of prayers, with the reading of the Torah, with the you know, uh, giving you know, to the poor, etc. In other words, they simply said, we don't have a sacrifice to forgive us of our sins, so what are we going to do? We're just going to count up our good deeds. And our good deeds will become a substitute sacrifice. Does that make sense? Now, there's a fatal flaw in their view, obviously. I'm just, I know I'm simplifying, I'm overgeneralizing, understood. But that is modern Judaism, basically. It's what you do with your alms, good deeds, prayers, etc. That's what is the substitute for the sacrifice. Um, and so that's how they're earning favor before God. And yet the Bible, as we've said often, the Bible points out the fatal flaw in that. That it's not your good deeds that get you into heaven, it's your bad deeds that keep you out. And so, to be fair, it doesn't matter to a Jew how many good deeds they do, according to the Bible, they're good deeds. They can't pile up enough good deeds to get into heaven. It's their bad deeds that keep them out. And a good deed does not cancel a bad deed. It doesn't work that way. You need a sacrifice to cancel and remove and cleanse you from that bad deed. 
and a Jew recognizes that, you know, but that's the that's the inherent contradiction in Judaism is they see that, but then they almost on the other hand deny it and they substitute their good works for a sacrifice, but it doesn't work that way. And so by rejecting the sacrifice of Christ, you know, the Jewish a Jew who does that, a Jew who rejects Jesus as the Messiah, they have no sacrifice for their sin. And that's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. Remember Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, the author of Hebrews says, don't reject Jesus, because if you do, there is no more sacrifice for your sin. And though that was true in his day, it's all the more true in our day after the destruction of the Jewish temple. So it's really sad, but a, uh, you know, a Jew will reject Jesus as Messiah. They don't have sacrifices, and so they just try and substitute sacrifices with good deeds, and it's really kind of sad, but that's what they're doing. They're striving to earn their way to heaven. Everyone seems to be in a panic right now. Can you give us some ideas? How can we as Christians encourage others during this time? What about evangelism? How can we evangelize, evangelize right now? Excellent. All right, great question. And then we'll we'll end with this. And then next week we'll we'll pick up some of the pieces of what today some of the good discussion points like the rapture, etc. Uh, and we'll deal more with it next time. Um, but the the last question. Let's deal with this, and then we'll then we'll shut her down is the question is, okay, what about, uh, what practically, what can we do during this time? There's lots of panic, there's lots of fear going on, so what can we as believers do to not only be encouraged ourselves, but then reach out evangelistically to others? And again, let me, and I'm glad you asked, because this, let me just point you back to the original slide we started with. In Matthew 24, verse 35, this is the practical import of what we're studying. Is Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. In other words, how do we as Christians first overcome personal panic? Is we read and we study, you know, what Jesus said in the end times. And we recognize that Jesus saw this coming. His words will not pass away. Jesus promised that this would happen. He foretold it. You know, the beginning of sorrows, the, as we're watching this unfold in human history, it can be a very scary time if you don't know Jesus. Because you you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen after you die. You know, and, and it's it can be a fear-filled time. But for believers who do know the words of Jesus, we do know his words and we believe his words, then when this stuff happens, when we see an increase of, of pandemics, epidemics, earthquakes, famines all over the world and everyone's being in a panic, I mean, I, I'm not here to belittle it, but, but recognize on the, on, one, on the one hand, it's really an exciting time to live because we are watching the fulfillment of what Jesus said would happen. And so as a result, it should affirm us. It should bring us more confidence in Jesus' words. Jesus knows what he's talking about. And so it's like, wow, man, Jesus said this would happen, and it's happening. Man, Jesus knows what he's talking about. And so you should be more confident in the words of Jesus, all of his words, not just what he said concerning the end of times, you know, in, in what we would face during the beginning of sorrows and, you know, the uh, time period of the tribulation, etc. But we can also take confidence in what he said regarding eternal life when he says that he can grant to us eternal life, that we can live forever with him. And in other words, heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will not pass away. What Jesus says is absolutely steadfast and sure. Whether he's talking about the end times, whether he's talking about eternal life, whether he's talking about the new Jerusalem, or the destruction of the old Jerusalem, all of it is equally true. And so we are to take hope and confidence in Christ, in Jesus, and the words of Jesus in this time. Because, yes, you know, can we, should we take, you know, reasonable precaution for what might be coming? Sure, absolutely. You know, I mean, go to, Proverbs says, go to the ant thou sluggard, consider her way, you know, her ways and be wise. And the idea is it lays up for, this, for uh, the winter during the summer, and it knows that hard times are ahead, and we're being careful, and we're being watchful. Absolutely, all of those are true, you know, for Christians biblically, but we shouldn't panic. Why? Because Jesus says it's all going to be okay. 
that whether we live or die, and whether we live through this difficult time or die in the midst of this difficult time, we know what's hap what happens afterwards. We have eternal life. We have the confidence of what Jesus gives to us. And so as a result, we should not fear. He says, fear not. Remember, that was his first comment that he made after the resurrection. He appears to his, his followers. He says, fear not, fear not. Uh, I, I've conquered death. I've conquered sin, Jesus says. And so as a result, we don't have to fear. And so that that is the hope that we should rest in. The, study the words of Jesus. Study the promises of Jesus that he gives to us. Read your Bibles. Ask questions. Understand what it is that Jesus promised to us. And trust in him. Because that's what alleviates our fears. But it's also our segue into evangelism. Because there are people that have tremendous fear during this time of panic but they don't have the words of Jesus they don't know what Jesus said or they know what Jesus said but they don't believe it and so they're living in fear and panic and so let me just rehearse to you briefly the words appear and then we'll be done but first Peter chapter 3 recall this first Peter 3 and verse 13 or 15 rather Peter says this. He says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In other words, he says, You personally, as a Christian, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Trust God. Believe God. Believe his words. Trust in the words of Christ that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, Jesus said. So you trust in that. And when you have that trust and confidence, or as he puts it here, hope. What's hope? Hope is a present confidence in a future reality. It hasn't happened yet. Jesus hasn't come back yet. But I know he will. He said he will. And everything that he said would happen up till then, it's happening. So I have confidence in the present of something that will happen in the future. Jesus is coming back. That is what... The book of Titus, for instance, we'll call the blessed hope of the believer. We have the blessed hope that we will live eternally with Christ. But when you have that as a believer, the rest of the world doesn't have that. And so when they see your hope, when they see that in the middle of a crazy world, you're not panicking, but you're living with confidence and trust in God because you have God's words then they are going to ask you and say, Woo, why, why, why can you endure such a time like this? And they will ask you of a reason for the hope that is within you. And so he says, answer them. Be ready. Be ready to tell them why you aren't panicking. Tell them why you have hope. And he says, and do it with meekness. Be gentle about it. Be humble about it. Don't be a jerk, right? Don't beat them over the head. But be meek. He says, and at the same time, full of fear or reverence. And the idea is that you, when they see you answer from the Bible why you have hope and confidence, then that is the greatest tool that you have and God can use to influence them to maybe this Bible thing is right. You know, and that's why we're trying to answer your questions. That's why we're trying to teach through the Olivet Discourse is so you know you can know what Jesus said so that you can give it to others and you can say, yeah, you know, Jesus said we would be living through difficult times, but he also said that we can have eternal life and forgiveness of sins through him. And so use this opportunity as people, you know, people right now are going to be asking lots of questions. They're going to be wondering. They're going to be concerned. It's a time full of fear, etc. But that's that's okay. Use it. Use the opportunity to exhibit your own personal trust in God, fearlessness, or hope, which will then in turn be attractive to a lost and dying world. And they, they will, it'll open up so many opportunities for you to share the gospel, to tell them why you have hope. And again, Second Peter 2 or excuse me, Second Peter 1 says we have that hope because Christ rose from the from the grave. We have a living hope. I'm sorry, 1 Peter 1, 3 says that we have a living hope because of the resurrection from the dead. We know Jesus is true because he rose from the grave and he conquered sin and death. And so we can have hope and we can extend that hope to a lost and dying world. So 
Great question, and I'm, it's a good one to end with because that is the practical import of our study. That's why we're studying. All right, praise the Lord. All right, so let's close in a word of prayer, and then what we're going to do is next time uh, we're going to pick up kind of where we left off, summarize some various uh, questions that surfaced today, deal with them a little bit more uh, intentionally, particularly the rapture that came up quite a bit, and and then we'll... Uh, we'll, we'll see what kind of progress we can make next week. So let's close in prayer. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this. If you were able to tune in or we recorded this and so we can make it accessible to folks later, but thanks so much for being a part of it. Let's commit our lives again, afresh to the Lord and we'll, then we'll shut her down for today. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for the words of Christ, which will not pass away. Thank you for telling us what would happen before it happened, that, Lord, we can have confidence that you are true, that you are reliable, you are trustworthy. And, Father, I ask that each one of us here at Ruben Mountain Bible Church and all that are hearing this voice as they're listening to this recording, no matter where they might be, that, Lord, you would help them to place their personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, that you would help them to confide in the Lord Jesus Christ that they would recognize that there is only one sacrifice for sin, and it is the, the death of Jesus. There is only one way to have eternal life, evidenced by the resurrection of Jesus. That, Lord, only those who place their faith and trust in Christ will ultimately have hope, and we can triumph through this difficult time of panic and fear that has stricken our world. But, Lord, may we face these, these troubles and trials and hardships with firm confidence in your goodness and your grace. And then, Lord, may we turn and give that to the world around us, all for your glory. Bless us as we go our separate ways this week, as we spend time with our families, as we indulge in more and more Bible study and time in your word. And then, Lord, as we even prepare for future teaching opportunities, etc., Lord, help us to search the scriptures carefully and consistently and to take confidence in what it is that you have placed there for our learning. Thank you, gracious Father, for these things. And we commit them to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, Lord bless you all. Until next time. We'll, talk, we'll see you later.